This is the second panel. It's going to be focused on policy. And this panel has a combination of uh, policy makers and policy thinkers. And actually, every one of the panels is a mix of policy makers <laughs> and policy thinkers. But here's what we're going to do. Jack Hoadley from Georgetown University is going to speak about state policy in this area. He's going to really be reflecting how state policymakers approach this issue. Uh, you know, what are they attempting to do? What do they find you know, feasible to do? What more would they like to do but are finding it very difficult? Matt Fiedler, who is on the Council of Economic Advisors, uh, is going to talk about federal policy. Uh, you know, both uh, some of the proposals that the Obama administration has put forward recently and other ideas where the federal government uh, can do things. Uh, then Zach Cooper and Neeraj Sood, who are both economists, uh, they're both going to present additional ideas for policy to address this issue of surprise medical billing. So, Jack, could you begin? Okay. Well, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And I think it's really helpful to, to have this session on a very important issue of surprise billing. In 2015, my Georgetown colleagues, Kevin Lucia and Sandy Ahn, and I looked at what protections some states are offering to consumers in surprise billing situations. And this was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and in turn built on a 2009 study we did for the California Healthcare Foundation. And so in, in looking at these issues, you know, we looked at the variety of scenarios for balanced billing that you've already heard about this morning and really found that for the most part, states are focusing on two of those scenarios, either the billing that occurs in emergency situations or the surprise billing, usually the situations where people are in network hospitals but are getting some portion of their care from an out-of-network uh, physician or other provider. And whether that's, you know, they've managed to schedule the surgeon uh, who's in network, but it's the anesthesiologist or the radiologist or some other consulting physician or an assistant surgeon that turns out to be out of network, or whether it's some other type of care situation where, again, you know, we all know if you've been in the hospital, there are a variety of doctors who come in just to visit you and check up on what you're doing, and you really don't know why they're there, who they are, and some of them turn out to be out of network. Um, legislation, for the most part, does not deal with scenarios where you're intentionally picking uh, an out-of-network obstetrician uh, to deliver your child or other situations like that where hopefully you're well-informed, although some of the transparency issues will deal with that. Or uh, we don't mostly talk here about some of the issues around uh, some of the gaps in networks or transportation or lab services or some of the other issues that do also come up. But mostly what we've seen are state efforts to look at those two scenarios. About three quarters of the states really have no specific statutory consumer protections, although some may have related policies such as disclosure rules or transparency but don't sort of deal with the core of the issue that, as we've been talking about it here. For the 12 or so states that do have some kind of legislative solution that's relatively comprehensive, most of them have various of the elements that we've heard talked about already this morning. The disclosure and transparency requirements that are often viewed, and as Mark Hall said you know, in his, in his paper, necessary but not sufficient for, for dealing with this issue. Um, they also have elements, in, in most cases, of some kind of prohibition on balanced billing aimed at the providers, aimed at sort of protecting the consumer by not allowing bills to be sent. Some of the states have elements of hold harmless to require the insurers to make sure that no bill comes to the consumer. And I'll come back and talk about sort of the balancing of those two things. And then most of them have some provision around the adequate payment kinds of issues that we've been talking about a fair amount already this morning. Some way to get the payment right, whether it's a, some form of rate setting using one of those standards around Medicare, Fair Health, other kinds of UCR standards, or some type of mediation or dispute resol resolution provision. So what I want to mostly talk about is some of the political considerations that have come up as states have tried to deal with these things, and really helps part to explain why 12 states or so have done something, why three-quarters of the states have not. And we really are in a situation, and I think it was very well illustrated in the previous panel, where there are competing incentives. 
there's often a broad agreement from all parties, and again, we heard that again this morning, uh, that the consumer should be kept out of the picture. But the problem is, unless you create the, the mechanism to do that, it's hard to get to that point. You have the insurers who, who don't want to see a sort of hold harmless approach. They don't want to be left holding the bag and paying whatever the charges are. Uh, we've got the providers who want to sort of maintain their, their rate structure that they've set for good reasons uh, and not want to be subject to what in some instances has been very low UCR kind of rates, usual and customary rates set by insurers. And so that creates sort of the tension that, that we're operating under in the competing incentives. None of them want to be the bad guy. None of them want to look like the person who is causing the consumer to be left holding the bag. And so what states have to do in these situations depends a lot on the market and the political environments in which they operate. And so I think of some of the things that we've seen as we've talked to, to legislators, to stakeholders, to, to uh, legislators in the different states where we've looked at these things. And often it's the concentration of the provider or the insur insurance industry or both. So in a state where you have one large dominant insurer, the environment's going to play out differently than if you have a, a, a larger array of competing insurers. It's going to affect the underlying negotiations with providers that's going to set the framework in which uh, the rates situation exists. Or concentration on the provider side. If you have dominant provider groups, we know there are some states where all the members of a particular specialty may be affiliated with one provider group, and they exercise leverage that affects things. And all of these things uh, come into the situation where the political environment, the policymakers, have to have a recognition that any solution they do operates in the, in the context of those provider and insurer market situations and can potentially affect ne network negotiations and the other kinds of relationships between those things. So you do something to set a particular provision to protect the consumer in a balanced billing situation, you're going to influence potentially all the kinds of negotiations that exist out there between providers and insurers. The political influence of the stakeholders matters a lot too. So you've got states where traditionally in the lobbying process, uh, maybe the medical association is really viewed as that one powerful lobby you don't want to get on the wrong side of or the health plan, or the one large health plan, if it's a concentrated kind of thing. So again, they operate in a unique political environment that's different than what we sometimes see here in Washington, and maybe different from the state across the border. Uh, obviously, the difference is also in the, in the recognition of consumer uh, uh, interest in this, how much they're active, the consumer groups are active, and media attention. I think you'd find that a lot of the states that have dealt with these things have dealt with it because there's been media attention, perhaps to just one dramatic case, perhaps to a series of cases, but often that kind of puts the issue up on the agenda. So go beyond, going beyond that, you have to think about the role of political leadership and how that plays in and the different ways that, that operates in states. Recently in Florida, where I had a chance to, to be down there for a little bit of their process, you know, it was interesting because it was the office of the insurance consumer advocate, a state office, a state official, that kind of took it upon herself to uh, play a role in trying to get something done on this. And so she developed some of the case studies that were out there. She convened a couple of hearings to try to bring some attention to the issue. She helped to work with some of the stakeholders to try to do um, some kind of model legislation that could go towards the legislature. And this is an office that, that not a lot of people necessarily are aware of, but at least in Florida, uh, this was a particular part of the state administration that came out uh, and tried to play a role. And then it was a member of the majority party, the Republicans in, in Florida, uh, that decided to try to champion this bill. And as somebody said this morning, this isn't necessarily a red or a blue or a purple issue. Here was a case in Florida where it was a Republican legislature who sort of took the leadership role a fairly powerful Republican legis legislature in a, in a party in a state where it's a majority Republican legislature, and and he really tried to play the role of trying to lead this coalition. The first year in 2015, when they tried to do it, it failed. They ran into some significant pushback from some of the provider groups in Florida, and that ground the process to a halt. But they came back, and that's where the consumer advocate and the insurance consumer advocate came back and tried to reignite the issue for 2016 get things started again, the same legislator was willing to pick up the mantle and move forward. 
And what they did was they found some adjustments to make from the bill that was traveling in 2015, which have ended up being just enough to get past the political opposition that had been raised the first year. And so it is this kind of circumstance that plays out. Again, you're all here in Washington, you're, you're people who watch the political and the policy process. None of this is any great surprise. But part of it is how it plays out in the particular situations in, in, in particular state at a given moment. California went through a two-year cycle as well. 2015, unsuccessful. 2016, successful. Again, there were adjustments made to the legislation. There was compromise. Uh, Betsy talked about this morning that, that, you know, we talked about, she talked about things that started out looking for one way, and, and as I understand it, and I haven't followed the Californians much, but in the end, some of the lead provider groups and some of the lead insurance groups stayed at least neutral in terms of their public positions, and that allowed the legislative process to go forward. Uh, New Jersey failed. Large pushback from a major provider group in, in the state that, that, and again, I don't know the specific political dynamics that were playing out there, but they were successful in, in, in stopping that effort in New Jersey. In New York, it seems like it was much more of a, a process driven by some of the political leadership who then convened stakeholders from across the spectrum, convened the insurers, the providers, the consumers, the different categories within those groups, and tried to figure out what elements could come together and form the basis for a compromise. So again, political leadership finding a way to get some, come to some neutral position that, that involved. And what they did was to provide some, uh, some things that helped different groups. Connecticut, I think, had a similar process to what went on in New York. We also took a look at one state, in particular New Mexico, where there is no legislation. And what's interesting there is that the environment was different. So we were told by folks in New Mexico that there were relatively few providers. It's a relatively small state. Uh, health plans typically had contracts with most providers that, that practice medicine in the state. And so that right there meant there were few opportunities for balanced billing, surprise billing to exist. Uh, problems were infrequent, but also there was a spirit of when a problem does arise, let's see if we can come up with an informal arrangement and people can talk. And we heard some of this from the folks we talked to in New York in terms of the history there. The history had been, you know, the, the provider and the insurer, they get together, they see each other on the golf course or at, the, at some reception. They say, you know, we've got a problem. Let's get on the phone tomorrow and see if we can work it out. And it got worked out. But I think what we're starting to see is those sort of, and, and in New Mexico, that was sort of the basis for we don't really need legislation because mostly this, there isn't much of a problem. And when there is, we can work out. But I think what we're seeing is that that environment is what's changing. And the politics uh, is changing in the sense that we're seeing more of the narrow network kinds of arrangements. That means there's more opportunities for surprise billing. If there are more frequent situations where you go into the hospital and there will be a physician you meet who's not in the plans network. We've got more consolidation of insurers and providers of both sides. And so that means they have more economic market pressure to bear in those negotiations. And I think gen more generally, the negotiations over networks and rates in this environment have gotten more difficult. So whether, in fact, we see more total balance billing, I think is hard to measure. But we are seeing some of the conditions that can lend itself to these problems. I just, I'll wrap up okay. with one last thought, which is I think that it's still very early to, to judge the success of what's done. New York has only been in effect a couple of years. Obviously, California is just is not even in effect yet. It's just been passed. Uh, but I think it will be important to monitor, and as somebody said this morning, to, to, to make the possibility of adjustments. And one of the things we have seen in the dozen or so states that have these laws on the books, they have gone back. And Florida had a law that covered some situations. What they came back was to cover more. California had some situations covered. They came back to cover more or to fix things. And so it is an evolving process. Uh, and I think that's, that's kind of where things sit. Thanks, Jack. One follow-up. <clears throat> you had mentioned that uh, how con consolidated the providers and the insurers are has an effect, but you didn't say what the effect is. So if it's consolidated, you're likely to see more of a concern about surprise billing and also the likelihood of addressing it. Yeah, I think, I think that's, it's both of those factors. I think as you see 
consolidated providers, there are going to be tougher negotiations, maybe more situations where networks aren't as inclusive as we heard about in New Mexico. And then if, if they've got that sort of economic power, that's often going to translate to political power that says, you know, do it our way or, or, or no way. And so I think it, it has both sort of the market effects and creating the situations, but also sometimes making solutions more challenging. Thank you. Matt Fiedler? Thank you for having me. It's uh, been an interesting conversation so far, and I look forward to seeing the rest of it. Um, so I want to open just with a sort of quick CEA view on what the economic case is for sort of policy intervention in this area. Um, you know, I think there's a pretty strong economic case we've, um, that patients just shouldn't be in the middle here. You know, cost sharing has a real role to play in health insurance by encouraging consumers to be cost conscious when they seek medical care, and that includes sort of the choice between a lower cost in-network <coughs> provider and a higher cost out-of-network provider. But we also know from the sort of standard economic analysis of insurance that you know, cost sharing has a downside. It means that the patient is exposed to a portion of the financial risk associated with getting sick and needing care. And so that cost sharing should really be focused on the circumstances where that uh, financial incentive can um, encourage a more efficient or cost conscious decision. Uh, the circumstances we're talking about today are just not one of those circumstances for the most part. Um, the cases where the, uh, the patient sort of uh, is in a poor, poor position to influence whether they end up with, um, you know, in the emergency case, certainly very little um, influence at all, and in the sort of out-network specialist and an in-network facility, sort of fairly limited influence. So when you're look, talking about one of these situations where the patient is not allowed is in the patient's control, the sort of economic case for why an insurance product should include cost sharing in these cases is fairly limited. Um, so that creates a little bit of a sort of, if you're an economist, a little bit of a puzzle as to sort of why do we see all these contracts out in the world um, uh, that don't provide this protection. And I think uh, this sort of discussion so far has, has touched on a few different things, but I want to sort of pull out what I think probably the two sort of key components are. I think the one which uh, came up in the first panel is that uh, choosing among insurance products is complex. Um, and, you know, the even sort of the choosing among the basics of the cost sharing and network designs of different plans is, is, is a difficult de um, decision for consumers in and of itself. The sort of third order question of, okay, you know, how, what's gonna happen if I'm at an in-network facility and there's an out-of-network physician is probably just realistically not something that's ever gonna make the consumer checklist when choosing among two insurance plans. Um, and even if, uh, even if we were in a situation where, um, you know, that was not the consumer checklist, I think, you know, verifying that prospectively is likely to be pretty hard. Um, so that means that we're in a situation where the sort of market signal from the consumer to the plan in terms of what the plan design um, should look like is going to be fairly weak. And it's, you know, maybe not surprising that, um, that the sort of marketplace has not, has not solved this problem. I think there's a sort of another important component here, which also came up in the first panel, which is that um, you know the plans are legitimately in a in a difficult position here vis-a-vis um, -vis the providers, and that if they are simply told that they need to cover these costs, um, their bargaining position in terms of what that rate ultimately looks like is um, is is very limited, and now it's ultimately also going to have consequences for the consumers at the end of the day because they're going to you know bear that cost in the form of higher premiums. Um, so you know indicate sort of um, an indication that we sort of the need for being thoughtful in how we craft um, solutions here. So turning to solutions a little bit, um, there have been a lot of ideas put forward, and I think this discussion is a really helpful one because, um, as people have said, this is a complex issue, and I think there's additional thinking that needs to be done. I want to provide a quick overview of sort of what the administration has already done in this area and then what the sort of um, natural um, next steps look like um, from, from the administration's perspective. So uh, with respect to plans offered through the health insurance marketplace, um, we, um, so individual market plans, uh, we have some tools that allow us to make progress administratively. So um, I think one of the important ones is starting last year, uh, marketplace plans in the healthcare.gov states have been required to provide sort of public information, um, detailed searchable information on their um, provider networks, which makes it easier to con for consumers to actually figure out who's in network, who's out of network. Um, I think there, there are circumstances where that solves the problem. I think most of the circumstances we're talking about today are probably that's, um, that's not, um, not the most relevant solution, but it is, um, 
it does in cases where there is some element of choice, but there was no information to facilitate that choice before, uh, make things somewhat easier. Um, I think that the second thing that the administration has done, and this will take effect for the 2018 plan year, um, as many people probably know, the Affordable Care Act requires all private insurance plans to place a limit on annual out-of-pocket spending. Generally speaking, that limit on annual out-of-pocket spending only applies to in-network services, um, which uh, in these circumstances, you know, we really want to make sure that people do have protection against catastrophic costs. It's one of the sort of core functions of health insurance, even in these out-of-network scenarios. Um, so starting in 2018, that limit, again, for marketplace plans, is going to also apply to out-of-network charges um, at in-network facilities, uh, out-of-network charges associated with care at in-network facilities in instances where the um, patient wasn't prospectively notified um, that there was a risk of the out-of-network charge in that circumstance. So, you know, we think that these are, are, are both important steps forward, but, um, you know, we, I think we agree with the conversation on the earlier panel that there is a need for sort of more comprehensive steps in this area, uh, right? These are regulatory tools that only affect the individual market, so, you know, um, and so there probably is need for legislative action here that will sweep in the employer market, but also I think to, you know, one of the rationales that in the earlier panel of the rationale for federal action here is that will not only affect the state regulated sort of small group and large group markets, but also sweep in self-insured plans as well. Um, so the president's fiscal year 2017 budget um, included a, uh, a proposal along these lines, um, targeted specifically at the circumstance of, um, again, the sort of in-network facility, out-of-network physician case. Uh, and it would have had sort of approached the problem in two ways. Um, first is it uh, provided a requirement that in-network facilities take reasonable steps to match patients to in-network physicians. So, you know, we, we know there are, uh, the data presented earlier, there are some cases where there's no in-network phys physician at a facility, but in many cases there are. Um, and it is, you know, it's important and in the interest of the consumer in those circumstances that uh, people be thinking about that matching process in a sensible way. Um, there are going to be cases where that, that matching process is not successful um, for some reason. Uh, and so the second prong of the proposal um, require physicians who regularly practice as a facility to accept an in-network rate um, for, uh, for the services provided, um, ensuring that you know, even in the cases where the matching wasn't successful, um, consumers aren't going to bear that out-of-network cost in those situations, whether it's indirectly as cost-sharing or, um, or directly as cost-sharing or balance billing or indirectly through higher premiums um, that they're paying down the line because the plan's been stuck with the bill. Um, so the goal here, the fundamental principle, which I think there's been a lot of agreement um, on, is making sure consumers are protected. So um, in any case, uh, that, is, that is sort of where the administration is at this point, and I uh, look forward to the rest of the discussion. Yeah, Matt, any, any comments uh, on the proposals of the administration? Any comments on how they've been received, interest in Congress? Uh, um. Um, so, I mean, obviously, I, I think this event and, and what we see out in the press indicates that there's a lot of interest in this issue. Um, I think uh, in terms of, you know, what the near-term prospects are, um, uh, I don't have a, a great sense of sort of uh, actually the Hill dynamics on this one. So. Have you seen the, the nonpartisan attitude that uh, Jack reported in the states in the federal level? I, I think we, we have gotten the sense that this is, this is an issue that um, is, is hopefully disconnected at least to some degree over the sort of, from the sort of more acrimonious discussions over over the ACA and that it's a problem that we sort of people understand has existed for a long time and that we can hopefully work together to, to find a solution to. Okay, thank you. Uh, Zach? Great. Well, thanks and, and thanks everyone for, for coming. You know, this is a, it's a topic I care a lot about. We're, we're doing a fair bit of research on it and, and what we're starting to see is that surprise out of network billing happens, I, I think, way more frequently than we expect and that the cost to consumers is, is pretty big. I'm hoping the research will be out in the sort of short term here, and you know, I think talking about surprise out in network billing gets me sort of one part angry and four parts pretty optimistic. I, I think the anger is just that this exists, you know, and I think we need to keep in mind that there's pretty good data from the Federal Reserve that basically half of folks in the U.S. can't afford a $400 surprise expense without taking on debt or 
selling assets or really getting into to financial distress. And so you have these people out there who are facing real financial harm. And the sort of stakeholders, you've got doctors on the one hand who are the, the highest paid professionals in the UF. You've got hospitals who are doing pretty darn well. And you've got big insurance companies. And I think this is one of those things that just frustrates people. Right? So here are these consumers that are really struggling and, and all these interest groups are saying, yeah, it's, it's a big problem, but it's, it's really complicated. And I think we fundamentally just need to, to fix it. I think the optimism comes in in that there are a lot of things in healthcare that are very tough to solve and, and maybe darn near impossible. Um, I, I think this is one where it is a solvable issue. And I think where economics can come in is by saying, well, why does it happen? Why does it persist? And then what do we do? And I think fundamentally, out-of-network billing comes up because for certain aspects of healthcare, emergency services or anesthesiology, for example, the, the physician's buying a package, or the, excuse me, the patient's buying a package that includes the physician and the facility. Right? So they're not buying these two services separately. Yet, the way we contract is, is those two parts apart. And, and that's fundamentally the issue. And, and so what ends up happening is normally in, in most markets in healthcare, the physician faces this choice about whether or not to join a network. And if they join a network, they might face lower rates, but they're going to get more volume. The challenge is when we think about out-of-network billing where the patient doesn't have choice, where there are these physicians that you, you can't plan for, you can't avoid, what ends up happening is that the physician in that case can basically charge whatever they want. They don't have to participate in a network, and if they don't participate in a network, there's no consequence on their volume. Right? So the same competition that applies to almost every other physician group out there doesn't apply in these cases. And so the question is like how we bring the market discipline to bear on this space. I think the second question is, why does it persist? Right? Why does this keep happening? And I think fundamentally what we have is this sort of multiple equilibria problem where nobody wants to act first. Right? So if you're a hospital and you're the first one to crack down, you're basically going to lose your physicians. And if you're an insurer and you go out and you say, this is terrible, we're going to crack down the hospitals, you're going to lose your hospitals. And so nobody wants to move first. And I think that, in particular, is why we need to see both state and, and federal action. Now, when we think about the policy, I, I think we all agree it should, should protect consumers. And that's, frankly, what most of the states have, have been doing. To, to steal Collins' language, it's, it's addressing a symptom. right? So whenever you have these policies that, that focus on protecting the consumer, it's sort of after the fact. And then you get into this debate about how you set the rates. You've got sort of three options. Right? One's the hold harmless view, where you just force the insurers to pay it. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense, because then no physician ever has an incentive to join a network. And then the insurers ultimately pass the, the higher rates on to consumers. You can go the sort of Maryland approach and set some rate as a percentage of Medicare, and you worry about supply issues. Maybe you set the reimbursement too low. Or you go the New York route, and you have you know, mediation or, or you know, baseball rules or, or whatever you want to call it. And the challenge is that's like clumpy, clunky and, and cumbersome. So what's the, the solution? I think what it fundamentally needs to be is addressing the problem. I think what we need to say, for example, is some form of you know, hospitals, look, you're required to sell a bundle. Right? If you're going to be providing anesthesia, if you're going to be providing emergency services, you've got to sell a package. And that package has to include physician and facility services. Right? You, you just can't, we can't have this world where we have some element that's chosen that includes two things that we're contracting over separately. And I think the really nice thing about that sort of package idea, first of all, is it gets you around this issue of separately going after fully insured and self-insured products. Right? So you don't have that division anymore. What you're regulating is the unit. The second is it preserves competition. Right? So hospitals are still going to compete over price and quality to get patients and to, to join networks. Hospitals are also going to compete to attract physicians, the same way they compete now over the wages they give to nurses. Physicians are going to still have to compete in order to, to get jobs working in hospitals or, or contracting. We can figure out different ways for that negotiation to, or that, that engagement to happen. If Cedar and, and Tom want to employ physicians, they can do it. If they want to contract, they can do that too. And physicians will compete over that. And at the end of the day, insurers will compete over the breadth of their networks, the quality of their product, and their premiums. And so you end up seeing competition preserved at each of these levels. And I think, again, the fundamental issue here is that the nature of this service just looks different. And unless we sort of target that and bring in competition, we're going to keep sort of playing second best. Well, we hold the, the patient harmless, but we end up seeing what we saw in the first panel was this like perpetual debate over what the level of the prices should be. 
Zach, <clears throat> follow up. So you're talking about why this world that you sketched hasn't happened and the virtues of it happening. What steps would have to be taken to bring it about? I, you know, this is the, so this is where economists have an advantage, right? I, I work where the rubber meets the sky. Um, so I can, I can look <laughs> at the folks out there and you can, you can turn, the, you know, turn it into to law. I mean, I, I think fundamentally it's states, in my view, regulating the package of what gets sold. You know, and so basically saying, I, I would start with emergency services, and if I were in a state house, I'd go out and say, look, the deal is, if you're a hospital and you're going to sell emergency services, what you're selling is a package. And it, it's just that simple. And the hospitals can decide how they build the package. Again, they can salary the physicians. They can contract with physicians to provide it. But we're going to get out of this sort of crazy world where we've got physicians billing you and hospitals billing you for a unit that you're not split over. I mean, the analogy here is like if I took... Uh, I took somebody here out to dinner tonight. We went to a, a nice restaurant in town, spent 100 bucks. The guy brings me bread, we eat the bread, and about a month later, I get a $10,000 bill from the bread guy. Right? And, and I, didn't, I didn't choose it, it just sort of showed up, and he threatened to send it to collection if I didn't pay. Right? That's just a ludicrous way to buy food. Right? And in a sense, we've institutionalized that in healthcare. And the question is, what we should really be paying for is the unit, not the individual components. And I think, again, it's... It should not be an issue about debating the, the hold harmless and how the rates get paid. It should be debating about how we create a unit and then how we price that unit in the marketplace. Thanks. Now we'll go to Neeraj Sood. So um, I have the privilege of being the fourth economist to talk on this topic. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to tell you a lot of new things. Uh, and uh, just a disclaimer that unlike some of the other panelists, I really started thinking about this specific issue. You know, I've done a lot of research on health insurance more broadly, but about this specific issue about three weeks ago when Paul asked me to be on this panel. So uh, the way I approached it, you know, as a professor was, first, why does this occur? Because in some sense, if you want to craft a solution to a problem, you need to understand why it happens. And I came up with uh, four reasons why it might be happening. Uh, the first is, it's just an administrative hassle, what economists call transaction costs. You know, there's a provider, there are 100 different health plans. You know, I just don't have the capacity to contract with all the 100 different health plans. So, you know, I'm going to contract with the five or six big plans, and the others are going to be surprised by my uh, bills. The second reason could be uh, that the health plan has the market power. So basically, the health plan is telling providers, work for us at dirt cheap rates. And the providers are like, no ways. You know, I, I can't accept this rate, I'll go out of business. So the problem is in some sense, the market power at the health plan level, which makes their you know, network inadequate because they're not offering a competitive or a fair price uh, to providers. So that could be a potential reason. Uh, the third reason could be uh, that it's the other way around. It's the providers who have the market power and the health plan is offering a reasonable rate, but the providers have a monopoly in the market and they know uh, they control, you know, the patients really want to go uh, to them because they control, a, say, a large concentration of providers in a certain market. So basically, they're not going to come to the negotiating table. They're not going to accept fair rates. They're going to hold out till the time they get their kind of high monopoly rates. So in some sense, to figure out like which solution works, you, and I guess the, the fourth option, which uh, could be, is just uh, that providers or physicians like to give surprises. And I have a solution for that, but uh, I'll talk about it later. So I think the key thing is, if it's an administrative hassle, the solution is fairly easy, that you, know, you can reduce the transaction costs. The first time you see a patient from a new health plan, maybe you get UCR or a, you know, a, a rate but that triggers that now I need to you know, go and have a contract with this new health plan. So I think if it's just administrative costs, the solutions are fairly easy. But if it's either market power on the provider side or market power on the health plan side, uh, the solutions are more difficult. And as one of the speakers said that, you know, it will, this might vary market to market. 
So maybe in a rural market, you know, a provider has a lot of market power, and you know, in an urban market, maybe the health plan has a lot of market power. So this might vary depending on how many health plans are competing in that marketplace and how the providers are organized. Are they solo practices, or do they have a joint kind of uh, bargaining setup? So if you take the case where uh, providers have market power, what would be the solution? I guess the first solution is it might depend on whether the service is urgent or not urgent. If the service is urgent, then in some sense the patient has no opportunity to shop and you should just you know, uh, have the government step in and say this is the price you will pay and you can decide whatever is the fair price for that service. But if the service is not urgent or is potentially shoppable, then in some sense you want to keep the consumer in this marketplace because that's how you discipline uh, provider market power. So you want to basically you know, give consumers enough disclosure and enough opportunity to shop around. So not only say, you know, this is the estimate for this service, but here are a bunch of other providers who might be providing the service at a cheaper price, or here are a bunch of other providers who are in network and therefore your out-of-pocket cost would be lower. But ultimately then you need to make, have the consumer make the decision whether they want to go with the higher cost but maybe better quality provider, or whether they want to stick in network with the you know, lower cost but maybe lower quality provider, and so on. But ultimately, then you have to let the consumers uh, decide what they want to do. If it's the health plant's uh, market power, then you basically want to go with whatever Jeff says, right? That it's basically have new laws which mandate that health plants have to have an adequate network. And so you're kind of now tilting uh, the balance or the bargaining power in, in favor of the providers. And you're basically telling health plants, if you don't contract with 50% of the providers, then you are liable for any out-of-network bill. Or if you don't contract with a, you know, a fair share of the providers in the market, then you are liable for this. Uh, and I agree with Zach and, uh, that one way to kind of keep the consumers in this is to make it easier for them. And one way to make it easier is like, when I shop for a surgeon, I don't think about a surgeon and an anesthesiologist and an assistant surgeon as separate things. I'm just trying to figure out like, you know, which hospital or which surgeon is going to operate on me. So the prices I see should be for that bundle. It could be for the bundle surgery. Maybe it could be for the entire hospital stay. It depends because, and the way you define the bundle might change the risks for the hospital or for the surgeon. So if you have a narrower bundle, you just tell the surgeon, when you quote a price, you just can't say, these are my charges. You gotta quote the price for the entire surgery. Uh, then there's less risk for the surgeon. Or you could ask the surgeon that, no, it's not just for the surgery, but whatever happens in the hospital while, you know, post-surgery and so on and then that would be a bigger risk for the surgeon. So what that is, uh, you know, maybe it's open for debate and we can uh, decide. Uh, so one last thing that I was trying to figure out, how do we figure out like, you know, who has, what's the right price or who, you know, who has more market power? So in economics, there's a concept called opportunity cost, that ideally what we should be paying providers is what they would have earned in their, you know, in their next best job. So if they want an uh, anesthesiologist, what would they be and what would be their uh, earnings there? So, you know, that concept makes sense in theory, you know, in, a, in my classroom, but it's very difficult to uh, figure out what that is. You know, I don't know what Jeff would do if he wasn't an anesthesiologist. So I said, okay, let me just, you know, as a layperson, I would want to just know what are providers making? You know, what is their annual salary and how does it compare to something else? Uh, so I was sitting here and I Googled it and it said, looking at the average anesthesiologist salary would make you lightheaded. So I stopped there. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Neeraj. <laughs> uh, I'd like to uh, give the panelists an opportunity to comment on other panelists. Yeah. So if I could jump in on the sort of discussion of bundle payments here, which I think is, is an, interesting, an interesting approach to this problem to think about. Um, I think probably most people in this room are aware that the administration is sort of very enthusiastic about bundled payments as an approach to encouraging sort of more efficient, um, higher quality healthcare delivery. 
and at the Center for Medicare and Medi uh, Medicaid Innovation as a number of um, tests underway testing those approaches um, in Medicare that, that we're very excited about. We often think about that, though, as sort of changing the structure of care delivery. I think the point that Zach and Neeraj have made that it also um, has uh, potential effects on sort of making bills more predictable and understandable for consumers is an important one and an important one to think about, given the fact that our cost sharing systems sort of often sort of follow the underlying contours of our fee-for-service payment system. Um, so I think this is an important point and actually a sort of underappreciated um, benefit of some of the efforts to rationalize the payment system. The one, um, and it'll have benefits both in the surprise bills context but more broadly, the one caution I would have is to the extent um, we're just shifting the sort of bargaining power problem from the insurer down to whoever's holding the bundle, whether that be the facility or someone else, um, if that's the case, then I'm not sure that we've fully solved this problem. We've solved, maybe helped on the sort of complexity dimension, consumer choice complexity dimension, but we may not have solved the bargaining power dimension. So I think the way I think about bundle payments is that uh, you're basically now asking the surgeon or the hospital to be the agent of the consumer. So we're basically recognizing that the consumer is going to find it difficult to shop around service by service, but the consumer might, it, might find it easier to shop around for a bundle. So whoever is the owner of the bundle is now acting as an agent of the consumer and doing bargaining on behalf of the consumer. And there's evidence of this, uh, for example, uh, in uh, the alternate quality contract in Massachusetts, where they tried uh, incentivizing physicians. And basically what they found was that physicians didn't, when they had an incentive to save healthcare costs, they didn't save it by kind of reducing use of care. Majority of the savings came by figuring out which facility offered the cheapest MRI and sending their patient to that facility. So in some sense, I feel like some other entity who's incentivized to shop around for the patient might be a better shopper for the patient uh, rather than putting the entire onus on the patient. And it really, again, I, we have to get back to this fundamental issue, which is that for certain specialties in medicine, the physician's going to see the same number of patients, whether their price is 1,000, 10,000, or 100,000, right? The, the, they're just not chosen. And, and as a result, it lets them set a, a price that's more or less out of, of thin air. So one approach is the bundle approach. I think the other, in a very, very different direction, sort of a, a consumer protection approach, where what the Federal Trade Commission would say in some respect or, or some form is in a sense that Insurance companies can't say a hospital's in network if you're going to go there and get an out of network bill, right? And then what you've basically done is you've put the onus on the insurer where they can't say something's in network unless the entire package is in network. But I think you need to really go in one of these two directions where you just, we've got to stop treating this indivisible unit as, as two separate items, right? The physician in the facility, at least in the case of anesthesiology or, or assistant surgeons or, or emergency physicians, those just come together. And whether you go the sort of consumer protection insurance route or the payment route, again, it's, it's really about treating these as one single unit. So if I can follow up, I mean, sitting here as the one political scientist on a panel <laughs> surrounded by economists, you know, I, I really go back in a way to Paul's question to, to Zach, and, and, you know, it's how do you get from a concept that's very interesting and, and has a lot of potential to how you would make that happen in reality? And particularly, how do you make that happen in sort of the political reality? Um, I mean, if a state decided they wanted to go that approach, you can imagine in a state where, you know, one insurer has, you know, a very, very large percentage of all the, uh, of the market, how do you go about, you know, setting up that kind of bundling situation or where one, you know, the anesthesiology group or the radiology group has is, is got a sort of a statewide presence and they can still say no. And how do you end up sort of giving the tools to uh, either the health plan or the surgeon and sort of that surgery bundle to say? And then, and then the unexpected kinds of things. I mean, when you're in a hospital, you go in for one particular surgery, but then something happens, your heart starts to do something funny. And so suddenly the cardiologist, the, the convenient cardiologist is called in that wasn't anticipated, um, you know, 
how do, how do you make sure that doesn't lead to the kind of thing? So I think about, you know, again, particularly at a state, if it's a state policy kind of thing, and, and, and we're not just redesigning the whole healthcare system in sort of one big swoop, how, how would it be possible for a state to sort of start that process to occur? So I think it's a, it's a great question. And, and I think the answer is how do you eat a whale one bite at a time? And I think you start with some of the units that are more sensible than others. And so I think you start with emergency care, where you just pick one unit that really isn't debatable. And you say, for, for hospital-based emergency care, this is what it's going to look like. And Jeff's going to come running at me and, and you know, he's going to tell me this is a bad idea. Yeah, exactly. So he's lurching. <laughs> uh, he's got the CrossFit ready. Um, you know, but you say, this is where we're going to start. And hopefully it works. Might not. Might not get through. But you start one bite at a time. You take this example. It's incredibly egregious. And then if it works, you keep on expanding it out. But I think, particularly with this one, I think admiring the problem just like isn't the, the long-term solution. Yeah. I think, I think maybe another uh, solution here is to kind of have uh, health plans more accountable for their narrower networks. Uh, so you could you know, come up with a health plan index saying, what fraction of their beneficiaries in the last year faced a surprise bill, or how many of their beneficiaries went uh, out of network. Uh, I think that's kind of a, a summary piece of information, which I, if I had on every health plan, it would make it easier for me to shop around. Right now, when I see a health plan name, or if I go on the exchange websites, I really don't know like, what is the size, like in, a, in, the, in terms that a consumer can understand. In some sense, I want to know, like, what are the chances I'll face a surprise bill, and maybe that'll give me some pause. I might pay a higher premium for a plan with a, you know, with a, net, with a broad enough network where surprise billing is lower. So I think in some sense, this will again empower consumers to make choice, optimal choices for them. Some consumers might be happy with taking the risk of a surprise bill and having a lower premium, uh, but other consumers might want to minimize that risk and pay a higher premium. I just want to make an observation that it's, as I've been listening to this panel, particularly the discussion on bundling, and the fact that there's so much focus on the consumer is going to be more important in medical care than that's traditionally been the case. And there are a lot of things that probably have to change in order to facilitate that, that our medical care system grew up you know, as a fragmented cottage industry uh, where providers, you know, uh, relationships were developed for the convenience and efficiency of the providers, but of course they were just thinking about their own specialty and niche. And uh, I, I think people are just reflecting on the panel. I think people are much more serious about the term consumer empowerment and really thinking about how to enable consumers to be more active and more in control of their medical care. So, you know, I think some of the challenges of that, I mean, I think that as a principle makes a lot of sense. Again, I think that the challenge comes in the reality. So, you know, there's, there's two parts to that. There's empowering the consumer who is sitting with a particular insurance policy and is now making provider choices. And I guarantee you we've all tried to go through that exercise of I'm about to have a medical procedure. Is that particular provider really in the network? And so, you know, part of the consequence is how do we improve those tools? We had a situation in our own family you know, very recently, needed a lab test, and it seemed like the lab that was available through where the primary care doctor was located wasn't in the network. So that means now I've got to go somewhere else. This family member needs to go somewhere else to, to go after and seek out that lab test. And even that, I'm saying, well, do we know for sure that that other lab is in the network? So we have those issues, let alone the emergency kind of environment. And then at the point of, of health plan, I think you know, there's a question of... What are the tools we really need to make those? And I think whoever just said, you know, having that kind of data point on how much out-of-network costs, if we could come up with a good way to measure that and capture that, that would be great to have as a measure. But, of course, it's going to be sitting there as one of many different measures, and we're still asking people to make choices in a very complex insurance environment. Yeah, I think it would be a good time to go to the audience for questions. And uh, is Steve? Right, right in the corner. Hi, I'm Steve Lieberman, and I'm a non-resident fellow at Brookings. Thank you for the panel. I want to go back and ask this broadly, although, Zach, I think specifically your idea about uh, creating bundles. And 
I think uniform weights and measures improve markets, but they don't solve fundamental issues of economic power. So my question has to do with equilibrium pricing. And I think this is close to what Mark was talking about earlier, about the, the potential solution of having the hospital be required to have all the people, all the professionals practicing at the hospital be in network. And the question is, how does having package pricing, which I am not opposed to, I think it's a good in innovation, how does that, ch how is, is that fundamentally different in terms of the bargaining power of hospitals versus professionals versus insurers, yeah. how does that differ? Because that strikes me as, in the short term, what's the equilibrium pricing is the question. Yeah, so I think it's a great question. I, so I think the first thing we know is that hospitals have considerably more bargaining leverage than physicians and physician groups. And so I think one safe thing to assume here is if you took my sort of version of this, you might actually see prices go up a little bit. Right, in the sense that the, the, the hospital is going to be able to negotiate higher prices than the physician will independently. I think what it's going to do is it's going to lower the variance. Right? So by, by putting this unit in place, you're going to absolutely make the hospitals a little bit more powerful. And there's a, a whole host of antitrust issues related to hospitals that we could you know, talk on ad, ad, ad nauseum. But, but I think what it does do is it gets rid of this particular issue. And uh, again, there are a lot of issues in healthcare, and I think we just... We just have to start one at a time. The more you bring some rationality to the payment system, the more then you can talk about the market power issues because you've separated having to talk about physicians and facilities independently. And I think it, you know, the bundle payment does reduce search costs for the patient. So given a number of providers in the market with lower search costs, provider prices have to fall in equilibrium. So the idea is that if I just go to the first provider I see and that's the only provider I go, go to, that's going to influence provider behavior, and they're going to have high prices. But now, if you tell me prices of five different bundles for five different providers, and if I shop around, the higher price provider is going to, you know, is going to lose market share, so is going to drop uh, their prices. So, in some sense, there's this kind of this consumers by shopping around will influence uh, provider market power. But if there's only one provider, then it doesn't matter, bundle or unbundle, that one provider is going to dictate the price because there's no opportunity to shop. The woman sitting next to Alvin that had her hand up. Thanks so much. I'm Claire McAndrew with Families USA. Um, this is a really key issue that we and other consumer advocates have been working on. Uh, taking it back to the conversation about addressing this issue at the federal level, um, like you mentioned about the need for legislation, um, I do want to mention that uh, Representative Doggett has introduced uh, an act to end surprise billing last year. Um, no uh, Republicans co-sponsors yet, but um, a question. In the notice of benefit and payment parameters, the administration did ask for comments on what more they could do beyond, I guess, what I would call largely a symbolic um, measure to count cost sharing towards the out-of-pocket maximum. I agree it's helpful, but it doesn't actually take on the surprise bill part of it. It just gets at the cost sharing. Do you think there is anything more they could do at the administrative level, or do you think it actually takes you know, legislative authority under the Affordable Care Act? I didn't know if there was anything they could really do. So, you know, I, I think... You, we are sort of absolutely sort of looking for additional things we could do. I, you know, I don't honestly know how far the, the administrative authorities ultimately go here, and, and my suspicion is particularly outside of the individual market, um, the sort of ability to do things here administratively are more limited. It's not to say that um, you know, if people have ideas, as said, you know, seeking comment on these questions, I think we would love to hear them, and you know, things that are feasible um, certainly would be things uh, we'd be interested in. But I, I think a sort of comprehensive solution here probably is legislative. You know, and states have found that sometimes because the state has the purview over regulating insurance, that they can do certain things with, with regulatory authority as long as it's something that they can impose as a requirement on insurance. They don't have the same regulatory authority on the provider side. So again, there's a limit at the state level of what you can do uh, through regulation and often to get to these more comprehensive solutions that make sure it's not mostly insurance focus, they found the need to go to legislative solutions. Question? Yes, the person standing in the back. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Joel Slackman with the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. 
And I'd like to take this back to a more basic question in, in the report there's a statement, there's no serious dispute among observers that surprise medical billing happens to a significant extent. Um, and then it goes on to refer to anecdotes and, and a few studies. But, but what strikes me is there's really a dearth of, of evidence about the scope of the problem, the sectors where the problem occurs. So my, my question to you, and, and, and Zach in particular, since you referred to research, is um, do you think that more work needs to be done systematically to understand the extent of out-of-network, surprise out-of-network, the types of services, emergency, non-emergency, sectors, self-funded, group fund, uh, fully insured, since it seems to me that any, any solution uh, should be tailored to the problem. And the problem, at least as, as I see from the evidence cited to date, has yet to be explicated very rigorously or comprehensively. Yeah, so I guess I'll just jump in on that. So, so I couldn't agree more. Right? It's hard to tackle a problem if you don't quite know what the problem looks like. I, I think it gets at a, a broader issue, which is the availability of insurance claims data. And, and you're from you know, the blues, so we'll, we'll beg, on, beg on you for data. You know, the, the more data, we have a lot of data on Medicare. We don't have a lot of data on the privately insured. Um, I'm doing a fair bit with claims data and trying to use it. You know, we do have some research coming out that, that I hope will put some some parameters around it and, and be able to give us a sense of how often this occurs. I, I think what you've asked and, and what you raise is really the need for a national claims database so that we can begin to, to take the blues data, for example, and say how often does this happen to your, to your policyholders? And really absent more data out there on folks with private insurance coverage who are, you know, they're about 60% of the folks in the U.S., it's just very, very hard to, to look into it. But, you know, the challenge is more complicated in the sense that even an insurance claims data set doesn't get you to yeah. the full nature of the problem because if the issue is whether the provider sends that balance bill after the claim is adjudicated, that's not going to be known on the insurance claim because that's, a, that's an extra transaction. And, you know, people can report on it, but then we have the challenge of people don't necessarily understand whether the bill they got is a balance bill or some other kind of bill that's surprising to them, but not what we've defined narrowly here as a surprise bill. Um, we don't know how often, when there is the potential for a balance bill, that the physicians go out and actually request payment on that balance bill, reach a settlement amount, um, opt not to, to charge um, whether somebody else intervenes and, and, and covers it. And so it really is a challenge, and I, and I think you point to an important issue. We'd like to know that more. But, you know, we could, we could get part of the way with a more comprehensive insurance claims database, but even that won't get us to really what we're talking about here. And I think just understanding the, the causes is, is probably as important, that does this happen more in markets where providers are consolidated, or does it happen more in markets where insurers are consolidated mm -hmm. will really help us figure out what the solution should be. Yeah, so this may be an example of where, because of the problems of the data, policy will move forward based on anecdotes, for better or for worse. We have time for one more question? Yes. Thanks. I'd just uh, like you guys to help me understand. Sharif Zafrin from, uh, from Texas. I just want you guys to help me understand one thing. When we talk about economics, you know, it goes back to what the actual market price is. And we're talking around government set rates, this rate, that rate, whatever somebody else decides a rate is, as opposed to looking at actual claims data, which my understanding is Fair Health, which was created for that very reason as a nonprofit organization, has out there. So why is it in a context where you have design networks that are narrow by design, which means people are going to be out of network, or tiered networks where I'm going to be in network with one tier and out of network in another tier, regardless of what kind of bundle you put in a hospital, to benchmark it back to an actual market rate which, if it's paid fairly, eliminates the whole surprise billing problem. So I'm just having a hard time understanding that part of it. 
So if I can just jump in for the moment. I think you know the point you've raised here is one of the reasons that the, the administration's proposal was trying to tie to a sort of existing in-network rate at the same hospital in order to try to get to some sort of, and there are sort of pros and cons of various approaches here. But um, you know, I, that said, I think there are a variety of different approaches here, and you know, each of them have pros and cons um, from that perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think the fundamental issue is that I think the in-network rates have some meaning. The charges really don't. So there's basically a 30% correlation between the charge and the negotiated transaction price. And so the question is, when you've got one price that's, that's market determined through bilateral negotiations, and you've got this charge that's sort of you know, pulled out different ways at different organizations, how do you set the price? And, and I think it ends up being a quite challenging issue. And I you think, know, again, it depends on who has the market power. So if, if a health plan has a lot of market power, the in-network rate is going to be inadequate because it's going to be too low that you know they're controlling the price. And similarly, if the providers have the market power, the in-network rate might be high. So I think just saying it's a market price and we should pay that is not the correct approach. In some sense, you should be paying the market price in a competitive market where both providers and insurers have roughly more or, more or less the same market power. Then that price is kind of optimal from a societal perspective. And you know, the state, the state solutions have tried to you know, be reached in the context of the particular political environment that both reflects the, the, the market's status in the, in the state and some of the other political forces. And that's led, in the case of New York, to the, to the arbitration as part of the, the backdrop. So, you know, they can encourage certain things and set certain parameters, but ultimately the protection is that, is that baseball-style arbitration process where each side gets to make its offer and the arbitrator picks one or the other uh, what they really hope happens is that, that the fact that one or the other may be picked, and this is exactly the experience in Major League Baseball, is that most cases the two parties will come together on a number. And so if the physicians suggest you know, their charge rate as their bid, as their, um, bid into the arbitration, or maybe it's 80% of their charge or 90% of their charge, they're making a strategic decision. If the plan uses its UCR rate or says, okay, but we should come up a little bit because we don't want to you know, encourage that, that the arbitrator pick the other side, that's hopefully a process where the two bids will come in closer and either they will reach a deal or the arbitrator will pick one. But that's a way to sort of get around from these standards. Other states have seen that we can take Medicare as a starting point and then use a multiplier uh, to get to a point that, that sort of works politically in that environment. I think we've run out of time and need to close the meeting. I'd like to thank the staff of the uh, Brookings Center for Health Policy and the USC Schaefer Center for all the hard work they've done behind the scenes to uh, bring this conference about. And thank you to the audience for coming and for your great questions. <laughs>